So let's start this. Uh, I would like to not call the Longmont Housing Authority Board of Commissioners regular meeting to order. Uh, can we have a roll call, please? Um, Chair Joan Peck. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Sean McGuire. Commissioner yeah. Diane Christ. And Tim Hall, Assistant City Attorney. Harold Dominguez, Interim Executive Director. Sarah Dean, Public Safety Commissioner. Lisa Gallagher, Regional Manager. Commissioner Rodriguez. Commissioner Marshall Martin. Commissioner Yelga Farring. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you. 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 You're here for public advisory here? No, they're here for an item. Oh, for an item. Oh, yeah. yeah. Excuse me. Uh, first item on the agenda is the Longmont Housing Authority Board of Commissioners meeting to order. Do we have any and submissions of documents? Do we have any? The only one I'd ask is that we move the recovery cafe from 5D to 5A. Okay. That way we can get them out here early. Right. Just not to you. Do you need a motion for that? I don't think so. I don't so. think so. I just didn't bother. Nobody objects. Mm -hmm. uh, we're now at public invited to be. No, we need to approve the January 16th meetings. I move the uh, January 16th minutes. meeting 2024 minutes as presented. Second. It's been moved by um, Commissioner McCoy, seconded by Commissioner Christ. Mm -hmm. To approve of the January 16th minutes. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? That passes unanimously. We are now at public invited to be heard. You have three minutes and uh, please state your name and address. Is there anyone from the public here that would like to be heard? In the hall? In the hall? I don't think so. Seeing that, I'll tell the public invited to be heard. We are now at old and new business. The first item on that is the Recovery Cafe programming at the Suites. Uh, yeah, Commissioners, uh, we asked the Recovery Cafe to come in and present to you all today. As you will recall, um, they did receive CBG funds uh, looking at a facility, um, and we've been working with them to build a facility adjacent to the Suites. Unfortunately, because of the LITEC property, um, there were issues in terms of the uh, Recovery Cafe being able to get financing because the ground lease was a problem and, and working with the other investors. And talking with Recovery Cafe, we continued to proceed with uh, Recovery Cafe still being involved uh, with uh, providing additional resources to the individuals that live, live at the suites, uh, specifically related to recovery. One of the things that we know about the individuals that um, a number of individuals at the location is that there are individuals that are struggling with recovery and recovery and I'll let them talk about is more than just what we think about in terms of alcohol or drug recovery. Recovery is a much bigger product definition. And, and so um, I don't want to spill too much of their thunder, but we have uh, since the beginning of the year. Um, we brought uh, the Recovery Cafe out to participate in coffee and conversations with me at the Suites, where we introduced them to the residents of the Suites in terms of the services we're going to provide. And they've been working out there. I don't know how many times you all are out there now. So I'm going to turn it over to them to talk about where, you know, what we talked about, where we've come from, what we're doing. One of the things that I have decided to do, just based on the call volumes that we're seeing, currently in core is I am going to use some of my uh, city manager contingency because I think we're seeing more interest in this than we want. And so we'll use some of that really to help provide the supply to the group. So again, for Chris, I'll turn it over to you now. Okay. Is this the best spot for us right here? Or do you want us to stand or? You can come right here in the middle. Right <laughs> 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 yeah, where do you go? <laughs> Yeah, it might be better if you move around over here. Okay. <laughs> and if you well, can chair, Chris does a great pose. <laughs> yeah. There is video somewhere of that. Oh, no. Thank you so much for having us here today. I'm just going to give
give you a little overview of Recovery Cafe Longmont just because I'm not sure where everybody sits on knowledge about that. So um, I'll just bring us all to speed. Um, Recovery Cafe Longmont, we're part of a larger network across the country. So we're one of 60, 65 cafes across the US and um, we are the only one in Colorado. So what we have discovered is that the cafe is such a unique and special, has such a unique and special flavor that is so um, different than so many other programs that are offered. Um, we like to say someone goes to treatment um, to day 30, to 30 day treatment, where do they go on day 31? Mm -hmm. So we get to offer a place for people to come and we like to say this is a place to come and be and so it's a chance for people to come. We offer a, a fresh meal every time we gather. We gather five days a week. We are in the basement right now of Central Longmont Presbyterian Church. We've been there now for four years, or we're coming up on five years actually. Um, and so we're just so grateful to be there, ready to move on out. Um, and so we did the feasibility study at the suites and determined that was a little bit too much for us. Um, so we're moving forward, but one of the things that we said we would do is let's consider some programming at the suites and take this show on the road. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of looking at the suites, or we are looking at the suites as a pilot program. So, you know, brick and mortar is expensive and it's tricky. And so how do we take this, these services from not just, not just where we are downtown, but to the suites and beyond mm -hmm. and into Boulder County as well. So we are a community of refuge and healing for people who are in recovery. We like to say everyone's in recovery from something. So that means everyone is welcome. We typically though, work with a population that is at the intersection of housing insecure, substance, alcohol use, um, trauma, and mental health. That seems to be where most of our people are coming from. We have a membership model. It's a free membership. And we like to, um, we believe it's important for, for people of this population to belong to something, to have some ownership. So we ask three things of our members. Number one is they participate in keeping the place, keeping in the life of the community. So we'll ask them to do some jobs around or read our guiding principles. The second thing we ask of them is that they attend a weekly recovery circle. That is an opportunity for a group of up to 12, 10 to 12 people to provide accountability for one another, to check in, to see how they're doing with their goals. And those are, those are led by our peer support specialists. And then the third thing is, what am I missing? Uh, be sober in the space. Oh, yes. We need to, uh, we ask that they are substance and alcohol free in the space. Mm -hmm. If someone comes to the door and they're altered, we may ask them to come back just so we're not triggering our members. Mm -hmm. So it's a pretty simple model. Um, and so the second thing I talked about was recovery circles. So this is what we want to do in at the suites, is offer programming. So we'll offer a recovery circle to people at the suites, and then we want to mimic, or not mimic, but have the cafe mm -hmm. in the cafe space there at the suites. Mm -hmm. I'll let you go. Yeah. So, um, SAMHSA, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration, they identify four pillars of recovery. Like, what are the four things that really like get you into like sustained long-term recovery? And that's health, home, purpose, and community. And uh, you know, the people at the suites and you guys have done a fabulous job of getting that health and home. Right? Those are like two very key things. And I think where Recovery Cafe can really help is with um, purpose and community. So. You know, people come in and we have our meal together, we have a recovery circle, and then we do community building activities. And we've been over there twice now, and we still have another one to go. Just kind of talking with the community, seeing where they're at and what they'd like to do. And um, that's been really getting a really good response. We spoke with 20 residents so far, and um, a lot of them have identified, you know, just feeling kind of lonely or disconnected, but very grateful for where they're at and like, acknowledge like they've been on a journey you know a lot of them were unhoused and really struggling and now they have a house and you know they have a few friends there so we're hoping to really expand that and offer some um, classes that can offer recovery recovery capital and also um, just some fun right just to get to know each other so when you're walking down the hallways you know you know your community and your neighbors um, yeah 
Yeah. yeah. So we've been working on this since about January, and Chris has done two listening sessions that he just mentioned. You've got a third one planned. Mm -hmm. yes. And then our plan is to start weekly on Thursday nights from 4 to 6. Mm -hmm. 4.30 to 6.30? 4.30 to 6.30, 7. Yeah, 4.30 to 6.30 or 7, um, starting March 7th and doing that weekly. Mm -hmm. And then our hope is that if we see some growth, if our recovery circle gets to that 12 mark, then we'll add another night of programming in another circle, hopefully. And, uh, you know, talking with a lot of the residents there, um, a lot of them are on their recovery pathways, you know, like maybe um, if you're familiar with harm reduction, you know, you know, they stopped doing a lot of the things that maybe kept them on the streets or struggling and, um, you know, but they're not quite there yet. So I feel like, you know, the population is really ready. Like when they see us there, they're really happy that we're there and they said, we need something like you here. And um, a couple of even wanted more recovery specific support so that's like different groups or 12 steps or and that's I think something that we can also help connect with you know the, the recovery community even outside of recovery cafe mm -hmm. so. are there any questions that you might have for us thank you yeah. Yeah. for yeah. all your work yeah. it's, it's so needed yeah thank you. everywhere we're very fortunate that you're here in our city yeah we thank love you. it too yeah. it's fun it's great yeah, and I wanted to bring them in because I think what we're seeing, Sarah and Vincent can chime in, this is really part of the work that you all approved in the budget in terms of the clinicians and everything that we're doing because it is, it's hard for us to ride the manager line and, and, and we know we need to do community building. And, and so in many cases what we found is we've interacted with residents across multiple properties is it partnering with local organizations to really help us on the community building really actually will move us to success faster than if we just try to do it on our own. And so, you know, we, we partner with Recovery Cafe, we partner with the Center for People with Disabilities now. Mm -hmm. And so the whole point of this is to provide resources to the residents of our properties to help them be more successful in the long term. Um, and it's been interesting to see, I just think, when we look at the number of people they've already communicated with, mm -hmm. many of those are people who would necessarily communicate with us. Mm -hmm. um, and the work and the partnership has actually put us in a better position in terms of working with DOH and, and how we're looking at tenant selection now for the suites, because based on the investment that we're putting in, whether it's the city, the housing authority, or community partners in this, They've actually allowed us, and we're working on shifting the tenant selection plans, so instead of coming from the state and one home plan, we're actually going to be able to pull people from coordinated entry mm -hmm. at Boulder County, which mm -hmm. many of the folks you may be working with, public safety is working with the lead and poor, so it's really allowing us to house individuals in our community that need it so we can continue moving them down the journey um, of, of uh, becoming housed, becoming stable, and then potentially being able to move out of permanent supportive into other housing options. So, you know, this is the beginning of it. We've actually started talking. If it's successful, we may need to look at other properties because we know the same issues exist in some of our other um, housing for mm -hmm. Yeah, one more thing too on that note. So, um, all the staff that will be going to the suites all are peer support specialists, and what that means is uh, people with lived experience. So. Um, a lot of our staff even, you know, have used some of these resources and in Longmont, right? And so you're getting to speak with someone who's been where you're at and, uh, you know, has walked in those shoes. So that really helps build connection, build buy-in, and uh, yeah, just a great thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thanks for so having us. Um, so I do have a question. So in this, um, this was in our packet, the um, program your programming so yeah. you have not this is what you are planning envisioning for yeah. in connection with the suite so have you, have you implemented no this? that's yeah. what okay. we start in March you start in March mm -hmm. so that's what I was I was wondering but these are all the steps so the yeah. first hour second hour yeah. cleanup that's all part of yeah. your normal process mm -hmm. in your other yeah. facility yeah. okay yeah, and this will all be subject to change because okay it's such a unique it's such a unique yes. venue compared to what we do now, and so we're just going to have to really play with it and 
determine how do we stay true to our membership model uh -huh. and do it in a place where everybody's living. Yeah. yeah. That'll be fascinating. Okay. And that's part of why we brought them in with our coffee and conversation. Yeah. I wanted yeah. them Thank you. to see the interaction that we have with the residents and what we're doing mm -hmm. um, to really kind of start getting a sense of, you know, the different types of relationships that we have. Yeah. And that was really good for us to see what, we, yeah. what the population is and then and some of the needs and to really realize like, oh, we've got to maybe have more than two people, yeah. mm -hmm. right? It's, we're going to have to really make sure we have our peer support specialists ready to go mm -hmm. you know, so we can make this successful. And, you know, I often wonder how many folks who are, ready, who are at the suites, you know, make the trek over to where your place is in downtown yeah. and then and, you know, and I think about, you know, anybody who's in crisis, you know, you're on fight or flight mode. Yeah. You're not necessarily have the wherewithal to go find these, the stop. these yes, the, yeah. well, and find find where you are and what yes. you offer. And yeah. so I think you know it's so key that you are having a presence there. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's thank you, yeah. and that's really what we're um, hoping to replicate across mm -hmm. the county if we mm -hmm. can. So thank you for letting us. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for being our tester subject. Yes. <laughs> Pigs. Yes, yes. And why would we want to recreate the wheel? Right. It's exactly. already here. Yeah. So it's, it's a great well, one. we may come back to you all and say, as we look at Lashley Street Station or we look at Spring Creek and Fall River or Austin mm -hmm. Meadows, we may want to say, maybe we do something here at these facilities, but maybe it's not limited just to the people that live there. Maybe we open mm -hmm. it up to the broader community because yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. what we're seeing is the Sarah can talk about this. There's a lot of interaction between the residents and our housing authority properties and residents in the community. Mm -hmm. And, you know, something that's sort of been niggling is I don't want to be in a position where there's somebody in the community that could need assistance and, oh, just because you live here, you can't do this. This happened today. One of our favorite people, he, is it Vivo? He moved over there and he said, I'm sorry I haven't been here. He's like, it's just so hard for me to get here mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. And I ran over to Chris and I said, oh, when we're at the suites, can we invite yeah. this mm -hmm. friend of ours? And he's like, I don't think so yet. Yeah. yeah. So, and for obvious reason, we right. totally understand. But it does, I love that you brought that up because I think the community is integrated, not just in the building, but mm -hmm. in us. Right. Yeah. yeah. And we did see a few people go came into the cafe, and you know maybe when they were living over there, were coming to the cafe. Yeah, it's like you'd be amazed how, you know, and speaking about like getting Longmont people into you know Longmont supportive housing, like that's building community right there. Mm -hmm. Those people yeah. know each other quite well. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great night. Good night. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, you can't stay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish you well. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. That was great. So now we're on the LHA goals 2023 accomplishments and 2024 focus areas. So. Because we're not yet far enough in our dashboards, you all have this as part of your packet. Mm -hmm. I still can't figure out what's going to be the right way. There we go. Um, so um, I'm not. I'm obviously not going to go over every bit of this with you all. Um, uh -huh. you, you can see this as, as we're looking to the future. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I wanted to get some highlights in terms of what you'll see in, in the accomplishments. So, uh, you know, the first one is we were, uh, Molly and team is able to really uh, work in stacking three federal funding sources. So if you remember, we had the voluntary compliance agreement with HUD that was actually created prior to um, the integration with, um, with the city. Um, many of those were capital improvements needed for ADA accessibility of the properties. Um, and so we've completed all of that work based on utilizing CDBG funds, ARPA funds. What was the other funding source? Probably. 
Anyway, here's a third federal funding source. And so we're able to do it. We have identified some other projects that we need to make additional improvements on, but we're working to find that's like hand railing being put in certain spaces once we corrected the first issue and opened up another issue. So really making progress on, on all of the ADA accessibility issues on all of our property. Uh, we sold 615 Main, which was a property for Center for People with Disabilities. That was the agreement that, you know, I think the value of that, based on what we're seeing, is around 650000 We reduced it to 500000 but then they're going to continue providing services to individuals with disabilities who live in the Housing Authority properties. They're also going to come in and do some training for residents um, and just start moving through. Um, all of our properties and working with this. And that was important because one of the things that we found as we, you know, we're still financially, we're making improvements, but we also don't have the financial resources to, to provide a lot of these programs on our own. So really the augmentation of Recovery Cafe, Center for People with Disabilities, is really bringing more resources to the residents of our communities. Um, we have restructured some supportive service positions um, to better uh, serve our residents. So. We had a resource specialist, and what we found is that the challenges that the resource specialists were dealing with were beyond a resource specialist, and what we really needed was clinicians to be on property because, you know, Sarah and I have talked about this a lot. When, when I look at, you know, I think you all talked about it in pre-session with the library in terms of the types of people mm -hmm. dealing with. What I will say is, it's not just the library, that's basically every operation mm -hmm. that we have these days in terms of the, the types of individuals that we're working with. But when I really look operationally, many of the situations that our staff deals with, um, uh, primarily a permanent supportive housing that we see it at all of our properties, is really more akin to what police deal with on the streets on a regular basis. So as part of the budget, we all we restructured to have a clinician one position at the suites at all times, and then you all directed the marijuana funding for two other additional clinicians that will help with all the housing authority properties, but community issues. And so we're getting ready to hire those positions. Um, obviously, the meth detector, Sarah will talk about that. We worked with um, you know a new meth cleaning company to reduce the total cost of meth contamination. We've updated the property tax exemption policy uh, to make LHA ready for income averaging. The Adrian House, which is a city on the property, um, the agreement's been complete. Um, it's rent ready now. Uh, we're continuing to make progress on the LHDC asset transfer. Spring Creek is almost complete. Um, we were able to bring in exchange a purchase city vehicles so that we could handle snow plowing internally versus paying contractors in excess of $200,000 a year to do that. Um, you may hear complaints. Um, we're still um, working on that in terms of fine tuning it, but uh, we're making progress. It seems like every storm we get a little bit better. Um, in terms of the 2024 focus areas, uh, and looking at LHDC, there's a component where uh, there's in order to keep their tax exempt status, they have to accept donations and really become a charitable arm. So we're working with the LHDC board to, to become the charitable arm for the Longmont Housing Authority so that people can donate money, furniture, things like that in the LHDC. So then we can provide that to individuals who move into our properties and in many cases don't have much beyond whatever they're carrying their clothes in. and. Um, couple of other things. And yeah, we didn't try to make a focus on money though, because sometimes people will give stuff that we practically have to throw away. So money is always best. Yeah, and so obviously we're going to be pretty picky. It's kind of like when you look at emergency management and, uh, you know, the philosophy that's in my head is when you're in emergencies, Donation management is the second emergency that you always deal with because of that very issue. And so we will be very specific. And it may be that um, the group that talked to you all at the retreat, home, home ahead, that there's a partnership there, but primarily financial. Um, we talked, I talked to Erica and Kendra. One of the things that we found in our citywide community giving campaign.
campaign is that many of our staff members will tend to give to organizations that are directly related to the mission that we're all trying to accomplish. And so next year, we'll move LHDC into that donation. It needs a tax exempt because it comes from the city. Then in, into that, and then so that helps us deal with that issue. Um, we're, we're working with the Humane Society Partnership for low-cost behavior training for support animals. Um, again, not all properties allow animals. All properties we have to allow support animals. And so we are dealing with some animal behavior issues in different properties, and so working for that training as a, as a component on it. Um, we're also going to be working on a home ownership readiness pipeline for Project Mustang as it's getting ready to come forward. So when we think about the residents that live at Aspen Meadows neighborhood, which are the townhomes off of 21st, those are individuals that may be the most likely to be ready for home ownership. So we're going to start working on that. Um, in addition to all of it, and you can see more of this, we're still in that development pipeline in terms of the projects getting ready to go. So Christmas going to open up. They may be releasing now. They're they're releasing now. I think it'll be completely ready by mid May. May or June. Um, Zinnia is on track to move forward, um, and then we're shooting for a closing on ascent on all the property and the development agreements by June, and that June will start construction on that. Um, we're also having some really interesting conversations about 121 Main that I'll be bringing back to you all in terms of some different opportunities to financial and potentially ownership. Uh, so we have all of this ongoing, but we also have a lot of development continuing to move in terms of providing housing in our community. I'd be happy to answer any questions for you all. I was wondering because you mentioned the animals, I had, been, I had asked you several, several months ago about having Millie and Annie come in and address. Mm -hmm. They are actually at the suites and they're oh, going to do some uh, vaccine clinics there. Perfect. Well, that's short in that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I believe they already have one scheduled. So. Mm -hmm. Good. I guess, yeah. Um, would it be, and I guess this is up to the, the uh, board to decide, um, would it be helpful if they came in like Recovery Cafe did and explain what they do and, and why? Would you be interested in anybody here? Yeah, your name? Sure. So Not maybe at some them. point okay. when we don't have a huge mm -hmm. schedule, we could have them if she really wants to. <laughs> In addition to that, so Lisa's also working with Kaiser Permanente where they're coming in and doing programs for the residents at different properties. I'm starting to have conversations with UC Health and LUH and we're going to get together in terms of what they can do to come on property and um, provide some additional resources to the residents of our Great. communities. Um, so there's just a lot, a lot right now moving in what we're trying to do. Okay. Um, the Seeker Advisory Organization has been failing to get those, that kind of outreach services going uh, for years, especially with London United. And is it possible to get uh, the uh, Senior Center staff moved into this? Yep. We will. Part of what we're trying to figure out is just, I mean, there, it's, it's, it's definition of what we're going to do. And similar to what you saw with Recovery Cafe, start small, understand it, and then see how we can start expanding it. But yeah, definitely. Okay. Uh, resolution 2024-04, adopt employee on-site unit occupancy policy. So like other housing uh, property management companies, LHA has designated units for employee uh, occupancy that um, are allowed for our property management agreements. Um, benefits of this include fostering a positive sense of community with the residents, enhancing the safety and security, 
and keeping a close eye on condition of the properties and proper response to urban needs. The proposed establishes rules and expectations for employees living on site. If approved by the board, uh, the policy will be in place for new placements in employee units. However, LHA does currently have staff living on site, so therefore, some of the aspects of this policy uh, that would require compliance that movement would be um, not be would not be applied retroactively. So our recommendation is adopt a resolution for approving the employee on-site occupancy. Um, and the fiscal impacts um, are not as these units are considered non-revenue and it's already budgeted and approved for through the management agreement. Would you like me to go through the actual policy? It is attached. Um, I think that we could probably read that ourselves. Unless there's any one wants it to be read to them. The question for Um So that's great. Can we have a motion for 202404? I'll move resolution 202404. Second. It's been moved by Commissioner Hidalgo Ferry, second by Commissioner uh, Martin. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Unanimously. Uh, resolution 202405, which is to adopt the 2023 C map certification. Um, okay, whoever's yeah. Um, so I'm covering for Tracy. Um, so um, every year we have to do a section eight management assessment. What that is, it's management answering these questions and kind of self certifies themselves and gives them points. So, you know, if we have a policy for a wait list, if the answer is yes, then we can give ourselves full points. And so there are several questions on the CMAP that she works through um, and does some testing. Um, so she'll test a certain number of files to see if they, if they pass. Um, the only one that she came where she couldn't give us full points was the HQS inspections. And the three areas that um, kind Sorry, of- Sorry, HQS? Um, health, health and safety. Okay. Health, quality, and safety. Um, so we do that um, for every unit every 24 months. Mm -hmm. So we go into the unit, unit, make sure it meets all the HQS standards because those can change. Um, if it doesn't and we get a fail, then there's a, depending on the type of fail, there's a particular turnaround that has to happen. Um, what we were finding when she did the testing was that we had a few areas where people had moved out right when their annual was due. Mm -hmm. And so then it didn't get done, so that kind of means us scoring-wise. Um, we had issues where somebody was sick at the time of their inspection and we had to reschedule, so we didn't get it within that 24-month period. Mm -hmm. And then um, the other thing we found was a systematic issue. Um, there was a permission in our software that allowed um, our HCB uh, specialists to override it just so they could finish the annual research. But what we found is they could finish the annual research and then no inspection would get scheduled. So we've shut that down. <laughs> they can't do the override anymore. So that's that, at least there's a separate permission for it. Um, so we fixed that. Um, but that was the one thing that she had to score us lower. We're still a high performer. Mm -hmm. um, and she submitted what you see today to HUD, um, and then we get council approval. Um, the auditors will also come in in April and do a bunch of testing. They'll pull a bunch of files, and they'll test a bunch of the same things that the CMAP, CMAP certify yourself. They're going to come in and test it and certify as well. And if they have any adjustments, then we have to make so what could you all have done with the health issues of the inspection that was rescheduled until later? Is there anything that can prevent uh, missing that again? Um, I can't speak to like what she saw or what she tested, um, but what we did find in the system is that they should be scheduling within the 23rd month so that you have that month gap. Mm -hmm. So I think I think what probably was happening is it was so close to the 24 that if you could schedule even a week, it's you would be over the 24. So we put in the system 23 mm -hmm. so that it actually schedules that on the 23rd month. Mm -hmm. 
And then she, we also found just this week a way to batch those so that she can batch them ahead of time so it's already in the system and it's, and it's, and it's ready to go. They weren't batching them before, they were just kind of doing them on a monthly basis, which ones do we need? Um, but we can batch them a year in advance or two years in advance if, if they've had it that month and we can batch it for that next, that next period. And so would that go for the same when someone is moving out as, as well? How does that, that work? That? I, that I don't know because, you know, a lot of the times we don't even get told we've moved out. We get told when the money gets to the landlord and the landlord tells us, hey, this person moved out. So by that time, um, there's that situation going on. And so they could be scheduling an annual inspection and they don't even know the individual's moved. Because mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's their responsibility to let us know they've moved. Oh. And so um, if they don't let us move, or if they don't tell us, or the landlord doesn't tell us, then we're kind of, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there's really no way to fix that issue. <laughs> and, and it happens all the time. I can't tell you how many times we're, we're sending money to landlords and then having to pull it back or they're having to pay us back because the person's already moved or, or they're just no longer there. Or, mm -hmm. To give you a uh, sense, I mean, the magnitude, I was, Cindy and I were talking about a different issue, but we average about 10,000 connects and disconnects on the utility every year, every month. So there is a lot of movement in and out of the broader system generally. So if it's happening there, and you just kind of take the percentages and work it to the HCP, we know there's a lot of folks that are doing that. Whether or not they tell us is a different mm -hmm. story. Looking at uh, these ratings, mm -hmm. you've done pretty darn well. Yeah. That's, that's great. So uh, we need a motion to move resolution 202405. And move 202405. Second. It's moved by Commissioner McCoy and seconded by Commissioner Yardrell. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? It may have been 10,000 a year just under 1,000 on the disconnect, but there's still a lot of volume. <laughs> 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 Thank you. 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 I just could imagine ten percent of the entire city moving. Yes. In a single month. <laughs> oh my gosh! Right. Nobody knows. Ten thousand a year, a thousand a month. Yeah. A lot of movement. Yeah. Even at, even at about a thousand a month. That's a lot of movement. Well, and I look at the ratings <coughs> that we're receiving now. You know, back when yeah. you know, we had taken over the housing authority in my first few months on the council, even. And it just like how much this or you know this organization has changed. We should all have stories. Yes. Thank you. It's huge. Yeah. Uh, Ascended Hover Crossing updates on funding uh, the early childhood education. Yeah, so I wanted to mm -hmm. talk to you all. If you'll look at in your packet this spreadsheet, uh, a few things I wanted to. So we're we're getting to D Day. Um, and D-Day is going to be Mayish, Juneish in terms of getting the funding. And so, when you look at it, so we went to DOH uh, for their transformational affordable housing grant. We were requesting three million. We put a letter of intent, um, and we were told not to apply. Um, we asked for seven hundred fifty thousand for worthy cause. We got a hundred and fifty thousand. Um, we all talked to you all about the ARPA interest income, putting five hundred and twenty-five thousand in there. Um, we're still working with both the Colorado Health Foundation and the Longmark Community Foundation. Um, we uh, submitted the application. So the conversations with the um, Longmark Community Foundation is they want to do it in terms of loans, and that doesn't work with the financing of the building itself, so we're still talking to them about that. Um, and then we're waiting on the Colorado Health Foundation. Um, we're pending response. I think that we um, hope to have that in April, May time frame from the Community Foundation. Uh, and then we've asked for 300000 from the Boulder County Sustainability Tax Allocation. 
that is for the distributed energy resources we're going to put there, but that helps toward the total cost of the project. Um, so it'll go to the early childhood education. Um, so we have a lot of it, uh, requests out there, but we're really still just waiting to get answers on that. One of the things that uh, we're starting to explore is if we're not able to get the full funding to completely build out the early childhood space, can we get enough funding to core and shell the space and then come back in and build the space as we're able to incrementally step, step into that, that project? And, and so I um, just wanted to let you know we're going to continue working to try to find additional, to find additional funding that um, we're going to have to May is really that deadline for us in terms of how it impacts the construction of the project. So, uh, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, so, what can we as commissioners do? I mean, should we start writing letters? Are there, you know, people that you think that we, would be beneficial for us to reach out to? Yeah, if you know people that are in the world, uh, that are in the early childhood world, mm -hmm. and that may be willing to do this. Can reach out to them, let us know, mm -hmm. to see who may be interested in. I did um, actually ping Stewart Foundation mm -hmm. again, uh, or late last week, mm -hmm. um, and I think there's there was an interest in the original, or we didn't hear from him. I was able to talk to Jim Newcomb mm -hmm. about this, and I think he's interested in it now. Also, because what a lot of people don't know is that property, much of that was actually owned by Alan Stewart. Oh. And so mm. the old radio station in that tower, that's the original tower location. And so that's why when you listen to uh, certain radio stations in Denver, and they'll say Denver and Longmont, that's because the tower there. So there is a connection to Lila on this one. Mm -hmm. So we are, um, oh, cool. I've got to give Jim some information on this and mm -hmm. what we can use. But it really is just helping us find potential revenue sources for this um, early childhood education center. So I noticed that the ARPA interest income of 525000 You, this is interest off of our original ARPA dollars, so we still have those ARPA dollars. This is just the interest. We have some of it. This is the interest that we've earned because some of those dollars are allocated to okay. other projects. Okay. And and so I'm asking for another run on interest again to see what we have available. I mean, come back to the council that says, can we push more money into the early child piece? Okay. Are there any other questions or comments on this? This is uh, really important. Yeah. Very mm -hmm. important for what we uh, what we need. And if you remember, the reason why we can't put it as part of the project is because that project is not in a qualified census tract, mm -hmm. which means you can't put it in the basis of the project under the tax credits. Mm -hmm. If it was in a qualified census tract, then you could include it in the basis and you could use some of the tax credits to support it. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason we're here is because we own the, pro the property. Mm -hmm. Which makes it affordable to get it. Yeah. Right. Mm. Susie, I liked your uh, commission with Uncle uh, I like your a I liked your ask about what we could do. Yeah. Rather than just listening <laughs> to Don't you all the time. What can you do? Work harder. Talk. Talk. Help us find money. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Find money. Find money. Yeah. Makes you calls. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, any other questions or comments on the ascent and home request? See, now we're going to move on to the interim executive director's report, development updates. So I gave you most of the development updates mm -hmm. um, in terms of where we're sitting. We are, I know I've talked to Erica, we, we probably are getting close to where we want to schedule a tour. To, uh, uh, and I'm seeing it both with the advisory board and the uh, and this board are kind of going through those properties. And I haven't even had a chance to go to Crispin yet to see other than moving around it, I haven't been in it, so see Christman. Um, is any other getting ready actually to start putting in um, a lot of the electrical plumbing work in there? We're actually looking, partnering with them. We're running an RFP right now for security services there. 
part of what we've seen at the suites is that we, um, we tried using building attendance and it didn't do what we wanted. Uh, we know that security is really important for that facility. Probably more so from the people that, not, not necessarily the people that live there, but from the people that who live, the people that live there are challenged with other folks that are in the area. And so when we talk about things like folks struggling with recovery and other issues, we know that people are moving around that property that are not the best influences for our residents. And so the security is as much check from the outside influences as, as it is from the in, inside, more so. Um, because what we're finding with a lot of the programs we're doing, we're better able to manage the problems internal to the properties. Now, that being said, we still see some significant issues. And it's not just there, we're seeing it on all the properties. But we're starting to talk with Element Properties about assisting with some of the funding this year because it's important that they have security once you start putting in the expensive stuff mm -hmm. into the units. One of the things that we've seen most um, apartment construction these days are having to pay for security services during the construction cycle mm -hmm. because the amount of theft that we're seeing at all of the properties. Um, and, yeah, and, Oh yeah. Are yeah, so theft. You know, you name the types of crime that's just happening. Yeah. There was there was an apartment complex that was being built, and this was not an affordable. This was a market rate complex. They lost a year mm -hmm. on construction because somebody went in and stole the standpipes for fire service. Oh my God out of a lot of the units. And so theft on construction site is really becoming a significant issue for us. And so we're trying to get through the RFP on security to help with the construction as any and to make sure we have people there that can monitor that. It's not unique to our projects, it's every That's project. That's I was going to say, it's across the nation. Mm -hmm. yeah. It really mm -hmm. is, it's crazy. We were even finding that after the Marshall fire that yeah. people who were, had already been through so much. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, uh, yeah, copper, anything copper, anything steel, yes. mm -hmm. you name it. And um, and so we're working through that. Sarah can talk about we're getting ready to finally, hopefully, implement the cameras, which will be part of the solution. Um, then, obviously, Ascent is really gearing up to close uh, mid-year and start construction on that. And that's the one, two, and three, one, two, three, and four bedroom units that we're building. And then we're starting to talk about another project that I'll need to, um, we're having some meetings to understand the different financing structures and what we can do. Um, I think it actually is probably a better approach for us, but I need to meet with our financial advisors to understand the risk and then we'll be bringing that back to you all. Um, long term, it gives us a lot of options that we wouldn't have under other state programs that are really intriguing to me. When we do this, when we look at the development cycle, we're looking at Kendra's fund balance sheet, and we're starting to program in when we need construction to come in and impact fund balance so we can continue to boost fund balance, but it gives us the ability to use the funds when we need to pay for security. We now have money that we can actually tap into to do that versus before when we were looking all over the place and under the cushions for money to, <laughs> to be able to find it. We now know that yeah. we have a robust enough fund balance to help us deal with different situations. And then also on the development side, really try, try to target a timeline on the lodge and the heart stone into when we can kind of convert out of the, the 202 program into the, the, voucher program. the voucher program. That's probably not going to be 25. I think it's going to be 24. It's probably going to be 25 when we can do that based on the workload. I'm going to hit a couple of other points. Um, we were able to hire um, some positions on the housing side. So uh, Lauren Seeley, who worked for, she is actually on the advisory board, um, but who worked for Boulder County Housing Partners. Um, has accepted the assistant director role, and then Christy Weissman has accepted the other housing role. So we are now 
pretty well staffed compared to where we were as we're moving forward. Um, a lot of changes right now, just staffing wise in the housing world. Every city is now starting to create housing programs, and so there is a lot of competition for positions um, in, in terms of the amount of jobs that are being posted for housing. Uh, it's pretty cutthroat right now. I think it's good to uh, to have hired the Boulder County <coughs> housing person mm -hmm. because that knowledge that she would bring as to what's going on in the county and what's available in the county is very, very helpful. Hopefully. Yeah, it's, it's part of understanding the backdrop and what's mm -hmm. behind it. And, mm -hmm. and yeah. so, and then as part of that, uh, Molly and I participated in conversations with uh, a group on, on the housing side related to the affordable and attainable housing tax and are starting to throw how we think the money should be divided and really wanting to replicate what we did in flood recovery mm -hmm. in terms of how we manage that process and, and you know maybe you allocate some based on per capita but then you allocate some based on projects and so um, I am having some really good conversations with the county staff in terms of how that works so all moving forward and uh, just know I mean people are cherry picking our staff when they get a chance on the housing side especially well all over but the housing they kind of hit us Mm -hmm. Like a ton of bricks. I mean, it was like boom, boom, and we're. we're That's like, what happens when you're really good at what you do. <laughs> I mean, people, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. That was good. Mm -hmm. Update on operations, occupancy report. Um, let's see. We did have a drop in occupancy. A lot of that is um, based on this week. We did have four evictions in January that were executed. They were granted in November and December, but we were able to have the sheriff come out and uh, execute those, so that did cause a drop in occupancy. But we do have four pending move-ins right now, waiting for those units just to be made, ready, made rent ready, so we can get those people in pretty quickly. Can I ask a question on the evictions? Mm -hmm. Is this new bill, if it passes, going to be a problem for the suites or any of the affordable housing units? So, probably the good news about not taking the position is it's being amended like crazy right now. I assumed it would be. And um, so I, I, I got the mm -hmm. uh, updated version, at least of where it stands today. And there's some really good things that they're starting to change into it. And, and, and so Sandy and I are scheduled to get together hopefully later this week and bring that back to council. But many of the, so we had some folks from East Boulder Echo, East County Housing, mm -hmm. yeah. that were, well, we don't understand it, or, and, and I get their perspective. What we were really cluing in is it's the unintended consequences on the broader affordable, attainable housing stock that we were concerned with. And so a preliminary look at many of those things I think are being addressed in okay. terms of you instead of saying you can't evict or you can't adjust the lease or do things, they're now saying you can, but you just need to give them 90 days mm -hmm. to find a, a, a new place to live. So they're starting to bridge the unintended mm -hmm. consequences okay. that we were seeing. They're talking about the quality of life, you know, what do they call it? The, um, we have it in our um, lease. The quiet enjoyment, oh, the enjoyment of property. Mm -hmm. They're starting to bring some of those components into it to, to really reinforce it. But, you know, operationally, where it would have impacted us is that, and where it was impacting all of is it was going to force us to go eviction only <laughs> versus what we currently do is we negotiate and mediate a lot of settlements before we go into eviction. And why that's important is because when you go through the eviction process, that's now the road. Right. Mm -hmm. And then people can't find a place to live. And that was the, our worst fear. Mm -hmm. uh, but we will be bringing that back to you. Mm -hmm. But it looks like it's in a better shape that we have to dive into. I do have a lingering fear about if you no longer qualify for the deed restriction. So, like, if your income raises to the point yes. no longer, yes. what we do with that? 
Uh, and that, yeah, that might emergency. just mean we have to pay. Uh, okay. So there didn't seem like there was a full blown exemption for housing authorities for that. But I don't know if that's been changed. I don't, and that's a conflict with HUD. So, you know, the state, they're trying to say, well, you need to do this if you no longer qualify financially. And if you have project-based vouchers on that particular right. unit or you have tax credit issues, then then there's a conflict point. And then I, I don't know that the state can do that, override HUD requirements. That's why I asked that question, too, yeah. about that. Yeah, that's what I was like, political view. It could, well, yeah. it could limit the funding coming in. So, mm -hmm. so there's there's still a lot more work to do on it, but they are making adjustments. Good. Sorry, Andrew. Um, don't have really much more updates on that. Um, we are moving through some of these uh, meth units. Um, we did talk about the meth contamination company we found. We have our second unit in testing right now that we typically would have had to rip out drywall and mm -hmm. part of the bathroom, but. We are very hopeful. It looks like they will be able to clean it with their system where we don't have to rip out. Oh. So that unit you know, will be offline a lot less than previous. And so. less expensive? A lot less expensive. It actually came in, we had three bids, and including this new company, and they were actually the lowest bid, with the lowest turnaround time. Mm -hmm. And you didn't have the demolition in the replacement. Uh, for, for Diane's, uh, information can you say once again the the amount that it costs to remediate fully remediate remediate well what's the highest give us most, the highest and the lowest most women cost about uh, i would say 120,000 probably for a one bedroom unit mm -hmm. we've seen something close to 200 on one bedroom right in the concrete yeah i think it was Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That was that was a while ago. <laughs> <laughs> I remember those numbers. <laughs> Good for demolitions, a hundred and you know when you do typical demolition, I would say between 120 and 150. Mm -hmm. You can see it go as high as 200, and even the cleanings are like 10 to 20. Mm -hmm. So. And your system was running about. 30 or 50? No, um, well, the unit they're testing right now is a one bedroom. Typically, for a unit testing the same, we would have spent 20 to 30,000 on demo. They are saying it was the bid was 8,000, just over 8,000. It's quite a savings. That's yes. why we're doing the meth detecting, right? That on top of this new company. So, part of it is what we, so you know what you know on meth or me. And it was really Doug Spite that introduced us to this company because they've been doing it in, in the Springs and Pueblo for a long period of time. And they use some technology that's part fire, smoke removal, meth removal, and so they've combined this process. What, what we didn't know is a lot of times the companies that were coming in were saying, here's the bid, but then they were just saying, you can't clean it, we're gonna demo, we're gonna remove it, which was then adding to the cost. This company's like, yeah, we don't have to do that. And we even gave them, we gave them examples of where people were essentially condemning um, air conditioners and heaters. And they're like, yeah, we, we've got a spot where we take them and clean it. So it's, it's, a, it's a paradigm shift in the market in northern Colorado. They're actually moving, they're, they're going to open a location in Walmart. Okay. So we're testing them because at a certain point, if we find that this works, and you don't have to go through all that demolition, like the individual that came to council who yes. had that huge expense, we're going to start saying, here, we can't recommend that we can say, here's our experience um, as a housing authority, because that really could be a game changer for the naturally occurring affordable attainable housing that we have in our community. Are they uh, uh, moving along on because it's centrally located? They're expanding north. I just wanted to hear that they were expanding. Yeah. They Not the because they thought, wow, we've got a great market here. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. no. They're there, you're right. They have an office in Greeley, and then they kind of want to get this area in the front range. So, like, Greeley will probably take um, Fort Collins and maybe Loveland. We'll take, you know, probably as far south as Lakewood. Mm -hmm. 
up to this area, and they just have a different model. We're currently pending this, the retesting results, so. If it doesn't work, we'll all sigh, and we'll try to find a different, but, you know, fingers crossed for both of those. It's even blown the, our testing company was amazed at what they could do on a low level unit, and as fast as they could turn it around and get it cleaned and back to us. And, it's saving my staff a lot of work because we're used to getting these units back after just being cleaned with all the texturing taken off the wall with oh, the no. thing. Um, that's what they have to do is remove all that film and we're getting these units back where we can turn them over in two to three days because the texture's not taken off the walls. We don't have to go back and texture paint and everything. It's just a touch up paint and light maintenance and get it back on the market. Mm -hmm. so, right. Right. so to give you an example, it's not only the cost of the remediation, it's the loss of revenue. Well, you can't put someone in, and some of these have been a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're good. So, is that your occupancy report? Yes. Okay. Let's go on to the fourth quarter accounts receivables. So, in uh, September of 2023, we owed about, uh, or we had about $68,000 um, on our accounts receivable. Of that, about Twenty-eight, twenty-seven thousand was reduced in December, but a lot of that was due to the past due balances. So it's the past due balances. Moving through the 30-day, 60-day, 90-day transition, not getting a prepayment plan, and sending them over to collections and writing them off. Um, what I notice um, on a monthly basis is it's it's random tenants here and there. So this tenant in January might not be able to pay, but gets cashed up in February. So. The current tenant balances didn't really fluctuate as much. You know, there was 9,000 owed in September, 10,000 owed in December. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's going to be that fluctuation depending on when evictions happen and where tenants are at in the process. Um, but there's nothing that's like red flag. Um, it's just the evictions take longer. And so if the person's not paying, you're just mm -hmm. accumulating more of those costs to write off. We've put about over $400,000 to collections, and we have not seen anything from that. So um, I don't know that we ever will, um, but we're kind of monitoring that to see how much administration work that is to send it to collections if nothing's happening on both sides. Speaking of evictions, I forgot to, um, so in the advisory board, you all appointed an advisory board member who's a mediator as well. Mm -hmm. Now obviously he doesn't handle anything that's on the housing authority side. The one thing that was really interesting that he mentioned to me is rarely do we evict for failure to pay because we're able to work with folks. Mm -hmm. and, and again, the most important thing is keeping people housed. Mm -hmm. And so we work with folks in different ways or we have a mutual rescission to where they can't pay and we don't have to evict. What shocked me is he goes, when I see the housing authority on the docket because these are significant issues he goes when i see everybody else that's on the docket he goes it's more minor issues and failure to pay and things like that mm -hmm. so for me that was really reaffirming and that the work that we're doing you know where the rubber meets the road and working with our tenants is that our managers are working at a different level and to kind of give you a sense of what what we're challenged with and where we're trying to think is when we look just generally at private properties, I'm sorry I can talk about this, the manager is the key to that. Whether it's a private multifamily property or it's a public affordable, your managers will dictate how those properties really function as part of the broader community and we're going to think about how we can start talking to folks and she can get into that with her. Okay. Okay. Um, was that it? Okay. And I think do the fourth quarter and the financials as well. Um, so I'll just kind of go over some highlights. If there's any questions, just let me know. But what I did try to do was highlight kind of the problem areas um, for each property. Um, uh, our biggest problem area was our vacancies. Um, that was that was the most over budget we were on most of our properties. And a lot of it's due to either meth units that have been vacant for a very long time. There's several of them that are, are that way. 
We also have issues with um, getting our 50 and 60 percent units housed. Um, we've done a lot of calls, and it, it just wasn't affordable for the people that were on our wait list. They needed something that was 30 or 40. Um, so, and that was AMSA was it was one of those big issues is that we couldn't get those ones housed. And I think we were at, I think this month we had four vacants for that one. So I mean we're already starting the year off with some pretty large vacancies, um, but hopefully we're on the path. We 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 tried. So we go with the wait list, but then if we don't have anybody on the wait list, we've start, started outsourcing into the papers and other agencies to say hey have these units available. And I don't know if you've gotten responses from those or not. It's, well, because we're dealing with the flooring issue, so it's making it harder to rent units yeah. because we have bad flooring in the unit that we're working through an insurance claim. So I have units with floor peeling and we've done some patches, but a few of our units are hard to rent. So, so the, other, um, the other things you'll see are insurance costs. So you'll have um, insurance repairs and non-insurance repairs because as a, you know, if we do have some math units, if it was claimed before August 31st, then it moves on our old policy, which still had the byproduct coverage. Um, as of September 1st, they took our byproduct coverage away, so we no longer have meth coverage. So any meth units where we're going will be a full cost. Um, and most of like if it costs 120,000 to fix a unit, it would completely deplete our reserve balance for that property. Yeah, I see so, we have an 81,000 dollar one here, 81,370. So in some cases where we're already strapped, it's um, as we met in the neighborhood, we're actually partnering with Habitat for Humanity. <laughs> Mm -hmm. to come in and help us do some of the work because that's cutting the expense down in terms of rebuilding the unit. The other areas, bad debt, you'll see some bad debt expense be pretty high. A lot of that is due to net units where you increase your revenue by putting on the tenant's ledger to say they owe it, but then you're writing it back off, so it's kind of a wash, mm -hmm. but when we don't budget for that high dollar, and then there are there are a few properties that have pretty high legal costs, um, and that's just tenant issues along with evictions. Um, evictions are costing you know way more than they used to. It's a lot harder. So those are the, the, the key points of the financials. Do you guys have any questions? Spring Creek is in a deficit. They are all pretty much look like they're in the fifth set. That's what kind of happens um, in December. So in December, um, we record the depreciation. Okay. So we record all the non-operating items, mm -hmm. which include depreciation for their entire um, portfolio, along with adding the accrued interest for all the loans that are on the property that are not really actually getting paid back unless you have cash flow, and they're in that cash flow like waterfall or close to. Um, but that's just kind of how these LIHTC properties work. And we don't do those till the very year end because it can skew the financials for the property managers. They may not think they have money, but they actually do. So it's a lot of the non-operating that gets booked. And you'll see probably almost every property looks like they have a, a net loss. But that's just due to those non-operating transactions. And so when you all see the budget, you see more of the operating budget. Mm -hmm. Because we're, we're really looking at what do we have available to spend versus bringing the depreciation in. And, and that's the tax credit component because that's in when the investor gets that value when it's it, it, negative. It, it provides the tax loss. Fair. For that. Yeah. Um, that's what it provides. Yeah. Okay. Public health and safety updates. Right. Oh, we have vouchers. Oh, vouchers not listed. No. Not listed. We're good. So we do have we do have the vouchers. Oh. Uh, if you guys want to go. This is I can do it quick. Do it quick. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> so this is our two year tool. Um, at the so we're still kind of in the it hasn't crossed over to the new two year tool yet. But what we're looking at is by the end of this year. 
that we're going to have to deplete our vouchers um, down to about 412. We ended the year at 426, and the reason we're going to have to reduce is um, we're gearing up to provide the PBB vouchers for Village Place. Uh, Village on May. <laughs> we, we still get caught up with that. Um, so that's kind of where this is at and what this two-year tool does. Unless HUD gives us more money, which we won't find that out until March, um, April time frame. And if they give us more money, then we might be able to voucher up. But we're at, a, we're at a standstill right now. We won't be able to do any vouchering up. And we're actually counting on our attrition rate, which is we lose anywhere from three to four vouchers a month. Mm -hmm. um, and we're counting on that to be able to add all 18 in October for Village on Main for the PV. So if there's something that the commissioners can do for us, that is, and we'll bring you back something that may be working on our congressional delegation, mm -hmm. um, maybe talk to HUD mm -hmm. about getting us some more funding on the, on the voucher side. Or, originally, we couldn't do that because our performance is horrible. Mm -hmm. The performance now, I mean, we're riding a lot. And, of fully utilizing the funds within the scope of the two years, which is typically an indication to HUD that you need more money. And so we'll, we'll get you all that information, especially for those going to national yeah, cities yeah, that, are gonna yeah. meet, that are going to meet the, yeah. the congressional delegation, is to really kind of talk this up because I think our performance now speaks for itself. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We need more money because then as rents go up and we're paying at one of five. Mm -hmm. Well, fair market rents also, that's that's another reason that builds yeah. into the equation. The fair market rents went almost $200 per unit per month. Not to say so as we start to see that, it's going to Too Reagan-esque, but uh, could you make it uh, one uh, one page so that we can quickly, briefly give them that specific so that they, because he's known for being very brief with uh, his... Uh, yeah. I, I asked for the same thing. It was effective. Yeah. Oh, we might say that times. <laughs> so oh. this was the first year we actually tapped into our reserves, about $150,000. Mm -hmm. Prior years, we had not tapped into barely any of it. Mm -hmm. So this is the, we definitely vouchered up. <laughs> but now it's yeah. like we play the game. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, we need our reserves. Is there any specific type of vouchers, or does it matter? No, just the... Housing choice vouchers. Housing choice vouchers. Yeah. Yes. And the more vouchers we increase, the more PDBs we can offer too, because it's based off of a percentage, so um, we're going to be pretty capped out on PDBs, so if any other agencies come to us, we won't be able to offer PDB vouchers, because we're going to be capped unless they give us more vouchers. Okay. And you know, to a certain extent, that may be part of the conversation that with the county associated with the broader housing project because we know about 50% of our vouchers are in lot which is roughly 400. Oh, oh, no, they have like double, they have double the funding we do, so they right. probably have double the vouchers. We're at 512, they maybe have 1,000. And, and about 50% of the 1,000 are here. here. Mm -hmm. So maybe we start talking to the county about getting some of their project-based voucher capacity to help with some of our projects. So we'll be bringing that back to you all. And I've mentioned it, they don't like that idea. But no, my point is, they wouldn't. <laughs> but my point is, I mean, if, if we're incurring, right. if they're here and we're incurring the, the broader expenses associated with it, then I think there needs to be some recognition of that for a long run. Mm -hmm. Well, are they giving the PBVs to other cities in the county? Do you know if they're using them or not? Because mm -hmm. I don't think they have that many projects going in Boulder. Just Willoughby Corner. Well, the county, I think the only big project they have is Willoughby Corner right now. And they're having their own, I think they're having their own issues with projects and mm -hmm. ongoing expenses. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think it's just a good conversation. Yeah, it is. Okay, all right, take it away. So we are this close to purchasing our camera equipment. Um, 
we're, we're literally just Tracy's been out for a little bit, so we're waiting for a few things for her to shore up, and we'll we'll be purchasing our camera equipment, and we are purchasing. I think maybe we mentioned this last time, maybe not, maybe it's new, but we are purchasing two meth detectors to put it. Um, two of our properties that we know have really good signal strength. Mm -hmm. um, that will be Village on Main and um, the Hearthstone. Mm -hmm. I was out at both properties today and we're getting very good signal strength at both. Um, so that is the update for the two and that, that means we're still really in the testing process. Like we know they work. We want to verify that this is the issue, that it be the carrier a connectivity issue. Um, <clears throat> as Harold had mentioned, we are moving forward with getting that security um, contract done. We submitted that to uh, procurement today, uh, and we should have an answer by the end of the week, I, I would expect. So we'll be moving forward with that, which will definitely help the other things we're talking about at Zinnia. And then as, as they, as they get the cameras, which is where there's another piece to that that we're trying to solve under federal procurement rules for the video management system. But then the security company, while they're at the suites in Zinnia, they will have access to the cameras at the other properties. So they're going to be managing and looking at those cameras at night. So instead of having them physically leave, they're going to be managing overall all security on yeah. all the properties. That's great. Very beneficial. Um, then as far as resident update updates go, it's been uh, the key word, as I've been saying this, this week. Um, we had a few, um, well, I guess, you know, thanks to Lisa talking to MHP quite a bit, they definitely stepped up to working more with the residents that we're seeing significant calls for service on. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're coming to the table, which is, in, I mean, about time. Mm -hmm. So um, we also have that ROI that has been worked on for months by Andy Feaster going out to the hospitals, getting the school district, like you name it, that it's listed on there for an ROI. Mm -hmm. um, so we can really wrap around these folks that are having significant issues. Um, and then lastly, uh, Harold had mentioned we briefly talked today about you know, what can we do, you know, and I have to say this, and I'm not saying because I'm sitting here, but um, the reason why we do not see the issues at the management level is because of the managers we have and, and the quality of the people that are working for LHA. Um, across our community, I can honestly tell you, we've had some significant issues in the last six to six months to a year with having no managers on site because they're they're um, it's a very transitory like I've been doing this for a very long time and I end up seeing managers bounce around like oh hey it's good to see you at this place now but um, literally they'll not have managers for a year on property mm -hmm. and that is caused some other mm -hmm. definite issues in these other huge apartment communities here in Longmont so moving forward um, I'm brainstorming with Dave Kennedy on um, how we can literally go when we know there's no manager for a significant amount of time and, and even we be more preventative in the fact that if we know we're going to have some a absence, what can we do, you know, going to the regional corporate level for some of these folks. We don't have these problems when we have a local, not, not necessarily live local, but if we have someone in Colorado, say they live in Broomfield and they own property here in Longmont, we do not see those issues. It's, it's these corporate level that cannot maintain their staff. So mm -hmm. we, are, we are wanting to look at that at a more broad level because it's, it's affecting the rest of our, our community. But for LHA, um, we're, doing, we're doing very well, minus, minus one manager, but we're gonna get back in, in the game and, um, and, and ensure we have a quality person to take over that spot that can handle that work. So maybe planning and zoning should not okay any property that does not have a local manager. <laughs> well, well, hey, I don't know if you can do that. No. <laughs> but, but I think, you know, what, 
when, when we're kind of talking about this, because what's interesting is when we look at, and it's a deviation, but it's connected. When we look at hotels that we're having problems with, or in, in multifamily units we're having part problems with, mm -hmm. the common denominator is that. Mm -hmm. And so, as a council, we're going to be, they're going to be, we'll probably have a study session on something that deals with hotels that kind of lets us attack that a little bit. Mm -hmm. What Sarah doesn't know is when she left my office, I started wondering, could we do something similar on multifamily environments based on if we're seeing an excessive number of calls for service mm -hmm. in terms of, is there something that we can do there that can put more emphasis on the owners mm -hmm. to, to start engaging on the problem versus it just being a public safety response? or whatever it is and so which oh my gosh then i mean the amount of condemnations right now that code has around our communities is huge so mm -hmm. it would definitely you know, talk about talking about staff like mm -hmm. yeah if you think about the, the meth issue that we're talking about it's just all over yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah i know you know i think that i may miss this, but we all got a bar L is closing with a big confidential across the top. And then there was nothing more said. But what happened? We have not, so we have not heard, I'm working very closely with bar L, Super 8, and Lamplighter, uh -huh. and we have not heard back from bar L. I do know that the owner um, is he got his own, I, I can't even remember the term, but um, help me out here, the certified hygienist, thank you. Um, I guess his son is in a restoration mm -hmm. business, so he and his son are working on it, and code enforcement and more public safety have heard back from John. Uh, we're expecting to hear back. It's still fenced off. Um, so we don't know. Don't know. So, um, one of their employees who was either, and I can't remember, he was either a uh, um, security guard for Bar L. And. Yeah. Yes, no. No talking. Yeah. Uh, later. <laughs> yeah. So no news on Bar L. No news. Yeah. I know nothing. A lot of people care about those and keep asking. Got it. Yeah. So, yeah. so we want to make sure that the, 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 the parentheses haven't been dropped. No, and before those, before any, I mean, we go through the same thing. Before you can reoccupy any of these facilities, it has to be okay by Boulder County Health. Um, yeah. And there's been times we've had to retest and retest and mm -hmm. so, yeah. so not. Right. Any other questions for me? Well, I guess just to close my parenthesis, so the, the, the answer is we don't know anything because it was confidential that they were closed for health reasons. Um, it was posted publicly. Was it? <coughs> it was posted publicly by Boulder County Health. So mm -hmm. Boulder County Health is really the entity that condemns. We, as a partnership with Dane, post the condemnation, but Boulder County Health is the one that controls that side of it. Is that the end of the uh, okay. I learned a lot mm -hmm. that I can't see. <laughs> <laughs> So do we have any commissioner comments? No, we move to be adjourned. Okay, we move moved by Commissioner McCoy, that we adjourn. Second. Second by Commissioner Martin. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Um, <laughs> yeah, what are you asking? Did you see Paige now? I did. I did say Friday at 10.